What's up, everybody? It's Pastor Brandon, and welcome, welcome, welcome to this Waypoint Student Ministry message on the mind. We are on a series right now referring to mankind's house, and that is our mind. We've been using this metaphor for a couple of weeks now, going on week three, saying how our minds are like a home, right? It's, it's, like, it's like a house, and there's different rooms, and there's an architectural design that is very intentional, right? And there's personality, there's character, but also throughout time, as we get older, as we experience things, we don't only experience good things, but we also experience bad things. We can go through some trauma, we can go through some betrayal, some hurt, and those experience effects um, and just impacts our mind, our home. Neurologists say that our brains are like neuroplastic, that it can change size and shape depending on what our senses pick up. And when you typically experience something, you're experiencing it through multiple senses. Right, you, you're experiencing with all these different senses, sound, taste, smell, right? And you're tying these memories with these sense cues. And uh, we develop these subconscious defenses to help us navigate through life so we don't have to experience the same trauma, same hurt and betrayal that we've experienced before. Last week we talked about what does your mind look like if it is haunted? referring to if your mind is being consumed constantly by certain thoughts, by certain patterns and ways of thinking. We talked about how the mind, right, that if it's haunted by the ghosts of the past, that you're, you're so focused on your past mistakes, that you're going about life and you can't fully joy, enjoy the present because your mind is just distracted by the fact that you feel that you are a failure past mistakes come up you feel like you're just you're not there that you're just losing unfortunately that you're just going to continue to be a loser and continue to make mistakes or a past trauma will pop its head up right it will scratch on that door that you have it locked up away thinking that you have it handled but in reality you just have it stored away from it being a surface level uh, appearance from having a surface level appearance to others we talked about the present, right? How the present can haunt you and you compare yourself to others as you look out, as you look at other people, look at their lives and what they go through and how they go about things. And you just ask yourself, why Why am I not as good looking as them or attractive as them? Why am I not as funny as them? I'm just a, I'm just a couch potato. I'm just this, I'm just that. And it feeds into your insecurities. And we spoke about the ghost of the future. Just basically just a lot of worry a lot of anxiety of what could happen and our creativity ends up being used against us, right? Something that's meant to, uh, to, to, to push us forward is now holding us back. And we talked about in the last couple of messages that we just need to learn to trust God, that once we can assess what is going on, and we don't even have to fully assess, but he just acknowledged the fact that we're not perfect, we have a sinful nature, that we need Jesus, that we're broke, busted, and disgusted. We just need to welcome him in, right? And that God is a gentleman. So he will uh, request to come in. He will call you, he will hit you up, he will try to reach you and say, hey, would you like me to come? Would you like me to help renovate your home, renovate your mind? I, I can deal with that infestation. I can deal with those ghosts that you're battling with, those demons that you're struggling with. But at the end of the day, it's up to us whether we choose to receive him or not, whether we choose to invite him in. And some of us don't wanna do that because we're too embarrassed by what he may find. But fun fact for you guys, spoiler alert, Christ knows everything. God knows what you've gone through because he's seen it. And in a way he's experienced it. He understands how you're feeling and thus he knows how to solve your your problem because he is god he is the master right the title of god alone means far superior than man so you, i feel that we can put a human mindset on god and we shouldn't but subconsciously we do that you hear a lot in church that we refer to god as father and it's unfortunate that many of us have not experienced what a true loving father is like we haven't experienced the grace and the comfort of a father, an encouraging 
father figure, male figure who believes in you and sets you up for victory and does not invade your security. Unfortunately, some of us has not experienced that. And to be honest, it's the opposite end of the spectrum. And the one that we were supposed to trust has invaded our trust, has trespassed and has caused a lot of harm and hurt. And with that being said, please not just, it's not doing me a favor, it's doing you a favor. Do not put the face of your father on the face of God. Do not put the face of your father on the face of God because God is all good. God is all powerful, he's loving, and he's graceful. Do not assume that you know how God's mind operates, especially if you don't spend time with him, especially if you don't spend time with him. As humans, we try to make sense about just about anything. We think we're detectives and we try to piece everything together. And sometimes we get pretty close, other times we don't. And so we need to be careful because assumptions doesn't really help us. When you assume too much, it can cause a lot of miscommunication, misunderstanding, and a lot of mishap. So I just want to encourage you today, please do not put your father's face, a human's face on God because you're limiting who God is. God has many titles, wears many hats, and he's perfect in every single one of them. For today's message on the mind, we're going to explore what does it look like if your house, right, your mind is one dedicated to God. It's one that has let God in to renovate, to clean up, to take care of, which is crazy because if God is our master and if God is our Lord, for him to come in and serve us, that's insane to really just process, right? That God is coming to provide a service to serve you and he's doing it out of love and out of the goodness of his heart. Man, we don't deserve that, yet he does it anyway. That is the God that I know, a loving, graceful, respectful God. Not one who, who is filled with hate, with filled with disgust. And it's unfortunate that we can get this misconception of God. And those ghosts that we talked about before can be tricking you into believing that there's the God out there is a God of hate and disgust. I think it's funny that we, it seems to be easier to believe in a God who hates rather than believing that there's a devil. I feel like it's all, people don't really talk about whether there's an existence of the devil, of Satan, but rather if there's existence of God, right? And it's, it's just a very interesting thing that I kind of find and how slick the enemy can be, tricking us into believing how, that, that to trick us to believe that there's a God out there who just doesn't have, want to do anything with you, when that is not the case. He loves you no matter what you've done and no matter what, you're going to do and when you understand that right when you know it here it needs to translate from head knowledge to heart knowledge for you to fully immerse yourself in that truth to fully walk in that truth so i want to read a scripture to you today it's found in joshua chapter 24 verse 15 and if it seems evil to you to serve the lord Choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whom the land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We will serve the Lord. That is very crucial. So let me give you some context and background information on what's going on here. So Joshua is this man, the new leader of the Israelites, that Moses, that God entrusted to lead his chosen people, right? God is following this group, helping them just travel and navigate from place to place to the promised land, the land that he had promised them. Just because it was promised to them did not mean there wasn't going to be a journey. There was going to be a journey that they had to go through. And generations went through this journey and it was tiring and it was frustrating at times because as humans we want stuff now we have a certain way that we expect things to go and when they don't go that way it can be discouraging it can be annoying and it can be frustrating but things don't go the way we expect them to go and so joshua right and his name the name joshua means yahweh saves God saves, right? Like God, Yahweh, it was God's name, 
saves, okay? And we're just remember that because we're gonna come back to that later on. And Joshua is giving this speech. This is the last chapter in the book of Joshua, right? And this is that final moment, that, that hurrah moment, that huzzah moment, whatever you wanna call it moment. And he's speaking with such confidence, right? With such belief, with such vigor, with such zeal, with such passion. And he's explaining to the people, right? He's explaining to them what God has done. And in this chapter, verse, uh, chapter 24, he's explaining what God has done for their parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, explaining how despite our mess, despite the sinful nature that we have, despite us being broke, busted, and disgusted, that God still provided, still loved on them. It even specifically says he gave them cities that they did not earn. He gave them fruit that they didn't even work for, that they didn't even plant. And it's, it's just really awesome to see that God's grace is even in the Old Testament. It's not just a New Testament concept, but it's just part of the character of God. And Joshua challenges them. They weren't struggling with idolatry. They weren't struggling with worshiping idols, okay? But he was challenging them and reassuring them not to by making that bold statement about you serve whoever God you feel like serving. If you don't want to serve this God who's done X, Y, and Z, do what you want to do. But I know for me, I'm going to serve my God. For me and my household, my wife, my kids, my dog. I don't know if they had dogs with them, probably. Like, I'm going, we're going to serve the Lord. And then he challenges them. They're like, and everyone starts, they start shouting responses. Like, no, we'll serve the Lord too. He's like, how can you? Like, just, he's coming for them, right? He is coming for them. And they're like, no, 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 no. we're going to, we're going to serve the Lord. We're going to, da, da, da. And he's like, okay. You know, like just, but got them to a point and really testing them to see if they really were about it. He was really trying to see and having them revealed to themselves, to the, their flesh, and any demon that would be listening, that they, they are about God's business. They're about their father's business. That they are like, no, we're fully committed. We're fully devoted, worshiping with mind, body, and soul. And that's a weird concept to understand because worship isn't really in today's modern vocabulary outside of the church. But that was a common term used in culture back then. And I feel like the more we gear towards technology, the more we, uh, I guess, disconnect from the spiritual. We don't use so much of these terms and it can be foreign and mystical uh, and unrealistic, but it's not. It's not unrealistic, it's reality. You are going to worship something, whether you're worshiping God or something else, worshiping money, worshiping fame, and whatever you're worshiping has the deed to your mind. Whatever you are worshiping has the deed to your mind, to what's going on in your head. And so we need to give our minds back to the one who created it, God. We need to give it back to him and allow him to come and renew us, renovate, as we said last week, to renovate our mind, body, and soul, right? To be a pleasing, beautiful, phenomenal, strong temple of God, a dwelling place of God. When the scripture talks about the body being a temple, it doesn't say house, it says temple because a temple is, is not, is, it has a specific intentional purpose behind it, right? And so we need to treat our minds, our bodies like a temple. We can't just let people in and out of it, all right? You catch my drift, you have to be careful. And, and it's not to put you in a fearful, like, hey, you gotta be careful and be afraid. No, it's knowing what you're worth. No, show some respect for yourself, for what you choose to feed your mind, to what you choose to listen, to what you choose to watch and consume. Respect your mind and this temple because you not respecting it and other people not respecting it led it to become haunted by the past, present, future, led to it to be infested for you to have poor character. So a mind that is dedicated for God, that's devoted for God 
is your mind is being served by God. God comes in, the Holy Spirit comes and starts cleaning things out, starts renovating. So imagine this, Jesus Christ knocking on the door, all right? And in response, you go and you open it. And you, as you're walking to the door to open the door, as you're walking towards it to open it, you think back to that phone call you received from him. Him saying, hey, I would, I would love to have dinner at your place, right? The King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, wanting to, to hang out with you. And you return the call saying yes, after some debate for some time. And now, again, and now is this point where he's knocked on your door and you open it. And he doesn't walk in until you verbally express it's okay for him to come in. A little scared and shaky because you know your mind is not clean, your house isn't clean, but you still let him in. And as you let him in, he touches the wall as he walks. And I can imagine him just getting, his eyes getting watery and getting choked up a bit. And you're thinking, man, he's probably, this is so embarrassing. He's probably just overwhelmed by how much of a mess this place is. He can just probably smell that smell I just can't get rid of, of shame, of guilt, and of just whatever. Um, I don't even know what that smell could be. And he looks at you. You don't even say it out loud. And he looks at you and he's like, no, that's not it. And he tells you, I just remember these walls. When I was writing the blueprint of you and who you are, I remember these walls. Scripture tells us that God knew us before we were in our mother's womb. And that scripture specifically doesn't pertain to us, but it shows the character of God, how intentional he is. How intentional he is. And so he's excited because he sees what your house will become because of you inviting him in and allowing him to renovate it, to go through your dirty laundry, to make things clean, to change things up. And you need to be obedient in that journey. And as you're obedient in that journey, remember the journey was gonna be difficult for the Israelites and it will kind of be for you too because you're gonna to have to tackle some things that you're not used to tackling. You're gonna to have to unlock that door where that goes to the past is locked up in of that trauma at some point or another for Christ to deliver you and set you free and to kick that thing out. But I promise you, a house dedicated to God is a house filled with joy, with life, inspiration, hope. That is a house dedicated to God. That is a mind dedicated to God. That when you live, when you operate, people are going to look at you differently with some type of glow. They're like, how? There's something different about you. It's like, ah, it's because of Jesus Christ. Let me share with you the good news of Jesus. Boys and girls, men, women, whoever is listening, I want to encourage you to not be ashamed of your God who loves you because he's not ashamed of you. He brags about you to the enemy. He brags about you to angels, excited for you to walk into who he's called you to be. He's excited to just uh, to, to, to clean your mind, to get rid of all those traumatic and just disgusting things that have just consumed it and tainted it. And with that being said, I want to encourage you to just trust God. It's the same thing we've been saying for the last couple of weeks. Trust the Lord. Start praying, start reading the scripture, right? Start fasting, do what you got to do. Just be obedient and I promise you he'll honor it because obedience is the scoreboard in your life. It's not about sacrifice. God cares more about you obeying him and it's a simple obedience and it'll get a little weird sometimes or a little challenging, but it's like, just hang out with me. God just wants to spend time with you during this season of your life. So bow your heads and close your eyes with me as I pray out. Father God, thank you. Thank you for this opportunity just to minister to those under my voice. I pray that you just bless them, God, that you bless their mind, Lord, that their mind will be dedicated to serving you, God, and in return, we get to see your Holy Spirit serving us, helping us with our self-control, with our anger, with our addictions, God, with our lust problem, gluttony problem, depression, anxiety, whatever we're dealing with. So, Lord, I just want to thank you for just coming into our lives, despite our mess, despite us being broke, busted, and disgusted. Lord, renovate our minds. I pray that we will not conform to the power of this world, but we will be renewed. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I hope you have a blessed day. God bless.